So our final presentation, we have two librarians um, who will be presenting for us. Uh, what are their order? Aaron Davis and Becky Toms will be presenting today, so let's please give them a warm welcome. All right, thank you, Harrison. So again, I'm Becky Toms. I'm the head of digital initiatives at USU Libraries, and Aaron Davis is our uh, coordinator for the regional campuses. And we are going to be talking to you about open educational resources and transitioning to using those types of materials in your classrooms. So I want to start, um, we'll get into a more of a discussion about what does OER actually mean and what does that encompass. But first we want to give a little bit of background about why. Why are we talking about this? Why does it matter? Um, so I have just a few numbers for you. One of those being um, $12,000, $12, $12,000. <laughs> $1,249, which is the average amount that students across the United States spend on textbooks and course supplies in a given academic year. So again, this is a number at the national level. Um, there was um, some data gathered in Utah recently by the Utah Academic Library Consortium, which shows that number is just over $800. So not quite as much, but still pretty significant. Um, and. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have maybe seen, there's been some mainstream media coverage of this issue of rising textbook costs. And you've seen that. It's been in the New York Times. It's been in the Chronicle of Higher Education. This discussion of the rate of increase um, on textbook costs, you know, outpacing inflation, outpacing the cost of medical and healthcare expenses, um, home prices, all of these things. So it's really just off the charts. Um, and then this kind of takes it down to the individual student level. What does that mean? And what it can mean is that um, as many as 87% of students um, I'm having a hard time seeing this. Um, we'll delay purchasing a textbook because of the cost. And thank you. 39% will um, ha say that they have dropped a class because of the textbook price. Um, and again, these numbers are actually from that same survey. So this is from UALC. At the national level, um, there are numbers that say 65% of students have not purchased a textbook for a course. And I'm imagining some of you have seen evidence of this in your classrooms, whether at other institutions or here. You see students trying to share textbooks or use older versions of textbooks or take a picture of their classmates' textbook with their phone. And that's how they're going to do their work. All of these things really not um, contributing to a positive learning experience for the student and making it more difficult for you in your classrooms as well. So again, these are some of the reasons. Um, there's a lot more data, a lot more statistics about you know, the fact that this really is an issue. But these are just some of the reasons why we are talking about this. So OER, what does that mean? So it means stands for Open Educational Resources. Open meaning that these materials are published under an open license, meaning they're freely available to use and adapt um, in the way that makes sense for you in your classrooms. Educational, that they are materials meant to be used for teaching and learning um, as an alternative to textbooks and traditional, um, more traditional materials. And these resources, this one's important because um, we're going to talk about the fact that these aren't just textbooks. So open textbooks um, get a lot of the, um, take up a lot of space in the conversation, but that's not the only thing we're talking about. We're talking a full, about a full suite of resources and materials that are open. Um, and in the bottom of this um, slide, you see the little uh, CC BY logo. So that's Creative Commons, um, which I'm guessing a lot of you are probably familiar with that term, familiar with that uh, little logo. And just to talk a little bit more about that, that's the open licensing system that kind of makes OER, um, well, anything open kind of work. So it helps you as a user understand when you find content online or when we as librarians help you find content. Um, typically, we're finding it online. It helps you know how the creator wants that content to be used. Um, what, what permission are they giving you? And there's a range of licenses, everything from the most open, which is CC BY. And actually, there's now a CC public domain as well. Um, but that's saying, so CC BY says you can do really anything you want with it. You can redistribute it, remix it, tweak it, build it. You can use it commercially if you want. 
Um, you just have to make sure you provide proper attribution. So give credit to that creator in the way they want to be um, credited. And then there are more restrictive um, licenses. So someone may not want you to use it for um, commercial purposes, or um, they want you, don't want you to create derivatives, or share alike, which means you can create derivatives, but whatever you create and make available, they want you to use that same license that was on the original item on whatever you um, create to build upon that. So um, again, this is, it's a really great system. It's very easy to use and not just for you as users recognizing what can be done with the content that you find, but also as creators. So if you are wanting to share the materials that you create, you have the power to say, here's how I would like these used. Here's how I would like you to provide attribution. Um, so those factors, it works both ways. So. So that's um, kind of the definitions, and so OER, Creative Commons, they're kind of the building blocks for this, this whole conversation about um, making, I guess, about making education more affordable. Now I want to talk just a little bit about some of the specific uh, repositories or um, places where you can go to find these resources. Um, these are just a few examples, and Aaron's going to go into a lot more detail about this. Um, but one of them is OpenStax. So this is out of Rice University. Um, it's been around since about 2012. And they are focused, while not entirely, primarily on full textbooks. Um, that is, that's what they started with, and that's, that's really where they focus a lot of their energy. So you can kind of see their catalog there. Um, things like physics, calculus, U.S. history, um, and government. So they're, it's clear that they're really looking at those high enrollment and gen general education type courses. So there's a lot of potential impact there. Um, these are courses that students all across the country at all institutions are having to take. So these are textbooks um, that can pretty much just drop in place of a traditional publisher textbook. And again, Aaron will give um, a lot more detail kind of about OpenStax and, and um, the, the background there. But it's just one example of a repository. Um, a few of the others that we um, traditionally look at, uh, one is Merlot, that's out of the University of California system. Um, so it is not the prettiest, their website, their interface is not the nicest, but it does have a large body of content. And what's important is that this is where um, this idea that it doesn't just cover textbooks. So you can search in there and find everything from a single page worksheet on a topic to um, labs, to PowerPoints, to interactive learning modules, as well as full textbooks. So it's a, it's a whole range of content. Um, another example, this is from the um, Open Textbook Library, which is out of the University of Minnesota. So that's been around for, again, probably just under five years. Um, and they now have, in, I think they have over 100 textbooks now, full range of topics. Um, and you know, anyone can contribute um, a textbook, anyone who's written one and wants to share it or feel like it meets a need. Um, there is um, a, a, some review process that happens. But what's really nice, as you can see on this one, is it actually has reviews. So it's an Amazon-style system where other faculty like you who have tried this in their classroom will tell you what they think about it and how it went. Um, so there's some, some vetting or some information um, that will help you as you determine whether or not it's something you would want to use. And again, that's the Open Textbook Library. Um, that's out of the University of Minnesota. And then another one, so this is OER Commons. Um, and this is much more along the lines of Merlot in that it's covering a really wide range of content. Um, you know, those little bits and pieces resources that I'm sure you all spend time either looking for or creating when you're teaching your classes, as well as full textbooks. Um, and you'll notice that it has some, it has some nice granular searching in, in terms of um, the subject area you want to cover, um, kind of the, the format and the type. And then you'll see education level as well, because as you can imagine, this issue of textbook cost and availability is really significant in the K through 12 realm as well. And and so a lot of OER is kind of devoted to that um, arena, um, as well as higher education. But this allows you to kind of determine the level that you're looking for, as well as the subject, and um, to help you find, find those things. And again, you'll find textbooks, and you'll find a, a full range of materials. 
And so now I'm going to hand it over to Erin, but um, what she's going to talk a little bit about more specifically about this OpenStax partnership and program that USU is now part of. And you'll see we're in, in pretty good uh, company that is really going to help us, we hope, um, really launch um, a more concerted effort towards OER adoption and creation um, on campus. So Erin will tell you more about that. OK. Thank you, Becky. So yes, hopefully um, some of you saw the coverage that was in the Herald Journal last week about our, the OpenStax partnership with USU. I think we were also in Utah State today. I think the Times might have picked it up as well. Um, but we're really excited about this. We're not, USU is not new at, at you know, utilizing OER. We've had a, the library um, has been working on a pilot program um, trying to get different faculty members to implement OER for the past two and a half years. So that's why we were really well positioned um, when this application process came out out of OpenStax, again, affiliated with Rice University, um, we were actually one of 11, I think we were one of 11 institutions um, that's going to be part of this partnership for this year. Uh, but there, it was a pretty competitive process. There were 50 other institutions that applied. And so we were really happy to be picked amongst them. Uh, but what this really means, it's a one-year strategic partnership. We get to work with their marketing and PR people. Um, but we're kind of in this cohort with University of Arizona. Yukon, et cetera. And together we're going to kind of we're going to share strategies about how to really, you know, get more faculty to adopt OER at their institutions and also just how to how to help students save money um, on these costs. It doesn't mean that, you know, that the OpenStax um, funding would go away after a year. So it doesn't mean that just because you implement one of the OpenStax books that all of a sudden after a year there, you know, there's going to be a cost associated with it. All it is is they're just trying to kind of get these initiatives um, jump started. So part of the power of, of OER is really the fact that it's enhancing academic freedom. Um, this, it's really providing faculty with more choices for their, for their courses. And so if you ever feel that you, know, you, you might be a good candidate for OER, um, if you just feel like you're tired of your textbook, you're, you've been using the same one, and you're just, you, you, we've, ha we've had a few faculty members um, in our pilot pro um, project say, you know, I just feel like I've been te teaching the same class and kind of using the same book, you know, year after year, the same PowerPoints. I felt like I just wanted to kind of have a fresh start. You know, that might be a good chance, for, um, or you might be a good candidate if that's one of the reasons. Another might be that you use your book, but you don't really use a lot of it. You might, you know, you haphazardly use a couple of different chapters, um, or you're already supplementing. You might be thinking, I'm actually already doing a lot of this. I just didn't realize that there was a name involved with it, that, you know, this is something that other people were doing. Um, that might be another reason that you're, you're thinking, well, why should I even put the textbook as a course requirement, you know, because you know, you, you, maybe you haven't checked in a while, but maybe that book has now all of a sudden gone from $75 to $150. Um, you know, it's crazy how much, you know, that there's, you know, new editions coming out all of the time um, and they hardly change anything. I mean, we're all, you know, no one has, you know, I'm sure you've all heard this. Um, and then the other big thing would just be, you know, you can get creative in terms of supplementing. So maybe you're not quite ready, you're not there at this moment where you wanna just completely overhaul your entire course. You know, we, I get it, I realize faculty members are busy, you have a lot of other competitive um, things going on right now with grants and trying to get tenure, um, writing papers. But um, the really great thing about it is that you can, you know, you can gradually kind of supplement. So you could, you know, for one semester you might decide okay, I'm going to use this, you know, this open tax geology book or whatever it might be. Um, but I'm also going to still require a textbook, but, you know, maybe just, you know, kind of do it more piecemeal that way. The other really interesting thing to think about is using library licensed materials. Our students are already paying, their student fees are going towards these library licensed materials. Um, they alone are paying, you know, millions of dollars every year collectively on all of these database subscriptions, you know, Wall Street Journal. Again, if, you know, if, if there are professors who are requiring these things, it might be good to think about, oh yeah, does the library own this ebook or does the library already own that subscription? So that's another thing to think about. Um, and then the, the final thing is just the, you know, feeling like you might be locked into a particular platform. A lot of these, um, especially if you do like an ebook version, um, or if you have that enhanced platform, like for you know Macmillan or Pearson, you know a lot of the times it's even more expensive when you get that. But what you get is the the homework help. So then students can go on, and they get um, 
you know, they'll have quiz questions and tutorials and all of these things. And we think it's a great thing when we're buying it, when we're selecting that option, but it's actually really increasing the price um, and you're locked into that one platform provider. Whereas if you go with an OER, typically you can, you're the one that, that decides, okay, there are 10 or 12 different ones that are, you know, half the price. They're anywhere between 10 and, you know, $30. Um, and that way you really get to decide, okay, which homework provider is really going to be the most helpful and useful for my students, not, you know, what is the, not just the publisher dictating to me this choice. Um, so who is, you know, who's creating these OER that we keep seeing? Um, it's experts just like you. It's, it's experts, it's people with PhDs in the field, um, and they, instead of, you know, they've written a book, and they've decided instead of you know, having it published you know, CC by, or instead of having it copyrighted, they decide to do it open. Um, they decide to release it under a Creative Commons publishing license because they want more people to be able to, um, to use it. And so the, the, the piece that we're really stressing is quality. Um, we really want to make sure that you realize the format does not dictate the quality. Um, it doesn't determine the quality. So just because something's online doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be, you know, of less value or less quality. I think there's a lot of misconception involving OER that you get what you pay for. It's free, so it must not be that good. Um, but really, it's the same thing. You know, I'm sure we've all, you know, you guys have, have been visited by many um, publishers out there, you know, looking at their, their different textbooks. I'm sure you've seen really good textbooks and really, really bad ones. And the same goes with OER. Um, you know, the librarians who are helping with this service at USU, we're not just going to Google and typing in, you know, free chemistry book and giving you the very first result that pops in. Um, instead, we've gone through, like I said, we've been doing this for about two and a half years. So we've really looked at, there are so many different repositories out there. Becky showed you a few of them before, like Merlot and OER Commons, OpenStax. Um, but we really have kind of narrowed our list down to like 15 or um, under 20 different repositories that we really like. So, you know, they're not all going to be peer reviewed. OpenStax is, um, they're one of the very few that are peer reviewed. Uh, many of the other ones do have these Amazon style reviews. But the really great thing about the OER is, like, De like Becky was saying, um, that open piece means that you, the faculty member, can go in and you can improve upon it. You can remix it, you can adapt it. Um, and that's where the real beauty and the power of OER comes in, that you can say, okay, this whole part right here, I'm an expert in this part, and they're, they're not doing it justice, and just get rid of it. Or you, know, you can take the 20-chapter you know, the book and condense it down into 10 that you think are you know, the, the most beneficial for students. You can go in and you can, I mean, it's really up to you. That's the power of it. You can even, um, you know, you can do piecemeal. So you can say, okay, I want these three chapters from this American history book from OpenStax, but then over here, I really like this Orange Grove textbook, and I like the way that they're covering this section. Um, so there's so much you can do. Uh, in terms of, okay, so where is this money coming from? You know, it's free to the end user, the student, but it's, there, there is cost involved. With OpenStax, um, and this is the nice thing about being an institutional member, is that we get the behind the scenes news from them. So I was, I was on a webinar with Nicole from OpenStax last week. It's actually the OpenStax, the, the, um, the average OpenStax book is costing Rice University a half a million dollars to produce. And who's paying that? It's philanthropic organizations. It's Gates Foundation, it's Hewlett. Um, I, there are a couple of other ones you can go on their website. And then it's university, so it's grant funded. The end user, the student, is not paying for it. Um, the other good thing to note is that we just recently applied for a grant here at USU. So we're hoping that we're going to hear back soon about that. But there is grant funding out there to, to help to incentivize more faculty to adopt OER. Because we realize that it's not easy. You know, it's, it's, not, you know, where it's not just a small thing to say all of a sudden, OK, I'm not going to use this textbook that I've been using for the past eight years. That's not a small thing. Um, and so we really want to make sure that you know, we're helping faculty um, you know, through that process. However, you know, so there are three kind of tiers to my, when I, when I wrote the grant, my vision was kind of the adoption, adaption, and creation. So adoption is merely just saying, OK, I'm going to you know, take this chemistry book that's out there from OpenStax open and use that. That's adopting the book. That's still a lot of work for you, but that's not as much work as adapting it, adapting it to your learning outcomes. 
Um, that's going to take. So that's going to be a higher tier, and then of course the creation, because um, unfortunately I've had quite a few faculty members from USC who come to me and say, "Oh, I'd really like to um, to find a book for environmental um, engineering or you know whatever whatever textbook it might be." And what's happening is that we're just, the, for, especially for the upper level classes, a lot of the times the OER are just not out there, and so that means that. You know, we really do need people like yourselves to start thinking about if you are ever in that avenue of writing a book, you know, you might consider doing it, um, you know, e either with OpenStax or using a Creative Commons license. So this is kind of a screenshot. Um, this is actually from Open Textbook Library. This is one of those Amazon style reviews that I was showing you before. This just kind of shows you if you've never seen what an OER looks like. Um, this is kind of the, you know, the outside version of it. So you would just go to Open Textbook Library, browse all of their existing textbooks. This one is Business Communication for Success. It's written from, um, by a professor from, I can't read what it says on there. But there, so anyway, you can see that all of the table of contents are on there. And then we have the different Amazon style reviews from different faculty members who have gone through and actually used it or at least reviewed it. And then the cool thing here is on the, um, on the left side, you can see the multiple formats. So your student, all they would have to do is just download the PDF. We would work with the instructional designers in City to actually integrate this directly in your Canvas course. Um, with OpenStax, they even have the option, let me see if I have it, oh yeah. They have the option of you can get the, um, the print textbooks at the bookstore, which is really nice. So it's just for the cost of printing, so it would be like $40. Um, if, because you know, there are some students who, would, who would really would prefer to have that hard copy. Um, the, the, big, the big caveat would just be, you know, some of these books are, they're very, they're really long. Um, this particular one, Principles of Economics, I think it's something like 800 pages. So if a student wanted to print this off, you know, it's gonna be, it might be hard for them to, to have this huge stack of papers. So, um, but again, they can, if they're fine with reading it online, they, all you have to do is just kind of, you would work with your instructional designer here in City and we would help you to kind of integrate that. And that's, and just what it says at the, at the top here, immediate access, many formats. That again is the beauty and the power of OER is that instead of having to wait for your students' financial aid dollars to come in in order to afford the textbook um, or all of their other many excuses for, for why they're not, they don't have the book that first day of class, that's the really great thing about OER is that you're on a level playing field. Everyone has access to the same book, the same format, same edition, starting day one of class. So you're not worried about, oh, the bookstore didn't get my book in, and so now we have to wait two weeks. Or this happened, this is why I, you know, I don't, Amazon is you know, on back order with my book, and now you have to wait until you know, the other students can catch up. We already kind of talked about this, um, but again, I think another common misconception about OER is that, okay, so it's just the book, but then I have to go and I have to create all of the supplemental materials, the PowerPoints, the test banks, the solutions. And that's the great thing too, is that you know, this is really, because this is not just a small initiative, this is you know, really um, picking up a lot of steam lately, you know, there, there are a lot of these resources out there. Again, it really depends on what field you're in. If it's something that's more obscure, if it's something that's gonna be a more advanced level, there may or may not be materials out there yet for you. Um, but if you're teaching a you know, high enrollment gen ed course, I can almost guarantee that there, there are gonna be a lot of really great resources out there for you. If you're teaching a more advanced level, then that's where the adaptation would come in. The adaption part of it is that you could take that basic, the basic stuff that's there and always adapt it or you know, get a, a grad student to help you. So what is the process at USU? Um, how do we actually, how, this all sounds great, but how do I get this to, you know, how can I start to talk about this? Um, this is really, this is a challenging process. And so we're not, you know, by, by no means are we making, making light of it saying, oh, of course, this is gonna be for everyone. Um, but this is where, this is why the library is really, you know, we're stepping up to try to help with this initiative because we're in the business of providing services to faculty and to students. Um, and so the great thing is we have Sharon Struvey. She's, a, um, she's our rock star OER student research assistant. Um, and so she, she's helping us with uh, locating different OER for faculty members. She's been working out with us for the past year. There's also, um, there is university and provost level support for this. 
Um, the great thing is that we, we ended up writing a proposal to the provost um, about, I guess it was fall semester. And so now in addition to having funding for Sharon, um, we, there is a provost sponsored committee. So it's a university level committee. Where it's uh, the, the dean of AIS, Robert Wagner, the dean of the libraries, Brad Cole, they're the, um, the, head, the chairs of this committee. There's faculty or there's bookstore representation, IT, um, student government, of course, faculty and students, and then the library and city. So it's been really great. And so we've kind of, you know, we've started to streamline and kind of, um, you know, create a workflow for how to actually make this, how to implement this type of a process, um, this type of initiative at USU. And so it would essentially be you meet with a librarian, um, meet with somebody on the team. Um, you would come in, you'd have your learning objectives, your syllabus, you know, the, the different content areas that you would want us to look for. We would go then and we'd start to, to try to find, see if there's anything that's suitable. Um, we're not going to just, again, this is not, you know, if, if we start to see that there's really not a suitable alternative, then it just might not be for you at this time. Um, and then, of course, you know, you as the content experts would be the ones to have to actually go through and review the materials and select the options. Um, and then, of course, we would get city involved eventually um, if you did decide that you wanted to implement this. One important thing to note is that if you are thinking about this, especially for spring semester, you really want to pay attention to the textbook deadlines. Um, so for spring, it's October 10th, and for fall, it's March 10th. So just you know, maybe put those two dates in your calendar. Um, if you haven't already seen this, when you go into Verba, you know, within Banner to select which textbook you're going to be selecting for your book for your um, for your class, there actually is an option for open educational resources. So that's a really fantastic thing to know about. Um, and also, we have an OER website. I think I had the link on the back of that postcard. If you guys had that, and if you go to oer.usu.edu. Um, there's a spot on there where we're spotlighting all of the different classes at, o at USU that use OER. And I think this is really going to, you know, hopefully this is going to take off with students, that they're going to be checking and seeing, okay, which classes are using OER, because these are classes I I'm going to want to sign up for. So at this point, we will take questions. Okay, I think you had your hand up for a while there. Oh yeah, so and I'm also the regional campus librarian, um, so I can we can uh, we can meet. I can either come. I'm going to be visiting the campuses this fall, um, so we can we can meet there. Which campus are you at? Right. Oh yeah, so we'll just we can have a meeting there. We could also Skype. We can you know we'll make it work for you. Thank you. Yeah, good question. I've been doing OER for a while, but wasn't aware of this. So a uh, person that's creating publicly, what's the process for working with you folks to, to get within the group here? That's a great question. <laughs> um, and I think that you're probably not alone. I think we probably have a lot of folks on campus, whether they realize it or not, that they have been, you know, they're adding to this body of work. So yeah, if you're interested in sharing those materials, we would love to talk with you. And we can certainly kind of help facilitate the process of adding them, uh, making them available through like OER Commons or um, even, you know, OpenStax if you had a full textbook. Um, but we can also use um, our institutional repository, so it's Digital Commons at USU, to make materials available. And we actually have done that. We have faculty on campus who've written textbooks that are openly available in their in the repository and um, I'm working with some math faculty right now who are creating lab modules that are available that way and um, so that gives it a lot of accessibility as well as preserving it um, you know kind of long term for you so would love to talk with you if you'd be interested um, about kind of capturing and, and archiving your work and sharing it that way so mm-hmm Oh yeah, so Commons, that's a great question. So there's, um, there's OER Commons, it's confusing, but then there's Commons within, within Canvas. How many people have seen Commons, have seen that feature? Uh, so there's a great thing with, you just, you're in Canvas, and if you look at the very, I think it's on the left navigation bar, um, you'll see it, it just says Add to Commons. And so if there's ever, even if there's like a document or worksheet that you're, um, that you're developing and you feel like, oh, I, I, I really would like other people in ITLS, 
to be able to benefit from this, you know, this, per this particular worksheet that I spent so much time on, or this tutorial, or this lesson, whatever it might be. You can add it to Commons, but then the really nice thing too is that you can um, borrow and share things from Commons as well. And there are different, you'll see the CC BY licensing on there. So anytime that I make something within the library, if it's a tutorial about plagiarism, I put it up there in Commons and I just say, all you have to do is attribute, you know, just send me an attribution. But yeah, I can always, if, you, if you're not sure, you want more detail about any of these things that we're talking about today, just send me an email, aaron.davis at usu.edu. I have a question about attribution. So um, in terms of demonstrating impact for P&D binders and things of this sort, um, with traditionally published textbooks, it's really easy to know number of documents, where it's been adopted, number of texts, and things like this. Are the attributions here, is this like, basically honor system that they'll contribute and how does it work tracking you know number of attributions number of adoptions so yes to answer your question it is on the honor system so um, but I think what um, the data will show you as far as CC by is if you are sharing materials anyway and you don't put a license on them people are still going to use them they just won't give you credit for it so this is really useful now to get more to the heart of your question like it's a great question and obviously faculty need to care about you know as you said demonstrating that impact and showing and there isn't that clear cut system with publishers it's one of the benefits they provide of being able to demonstrate oh here's how many instructors have adopted your textbook now um, I actually can't say for sure what kind of metrics you can get out of a system like OER Commons um, or OpenStax. So I would imagine they have them. I can tell you that we can give you excellent metrics like that out of Digital Commons if you make your content available that way. Um, and then I think if, if this was really something you wanted to pursue, I think it would be an interesting conversation to have to explore some of the alt metrics options that we could help you kind of um, take advantage of in terms of telling that story and demonstrating the impact um, of your work. So, but it's, it maybe isn't quite as straightforward as the traditional system, so. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>